Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. everybody welcome it's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on I'm adjusting my mic right there for everybody hello miss hey I'm bb well. i'm big good thank you very much for asking yourself good. yep olivia is also at the helm today um i am really I, I'm, I'm really excited I, you know i was reading i was reading uh allison's book allison carmen joining me here today Are you Math. Jump in there for a minute. I don't know what's going on here. What was this book all about here, Pat? Come on. Yeah, let me just say. Come on now. A year you can't without, do it without me, me right? It's a 12-point uh, guide. A year without me. But Ben, here. <laughs> to talk with and get to know my relatives, my aunts and my uncles. Mm -hmm. um, but my aunts who went through like World War II, do you remember that one? Uh, me personally, okay. no, but I know of it. Okay. Yeah, I'm reading okay. about so it. <laughs> I got to talk to these women who, when the men were gone, mm -hmm. as a picture of one of them, oh my God, I'm going to get this wrong. It's the bow. I don't know the front. It's the front of the, the ship. What is that? The bow, this, the, yes. whatever it is, it's the front of the ship. Okay. There's a picture of her, small woman, small, Italian small, with a hard hat. And a welding gun, gun, okay. you know, in the front of a ship, okay. welding. And so she talked about, and they all talked about what this was like. And when you hear her talk about it, she's, and, and you have to go back and understand where these women came from. Allison, you know, you think, do you think you, you know where I'm going, right? With yes, this for a minute. That. Okay. You know where I'm going, right? Okay. Follow <laughs> yes. me for a minute. And when I sat down and I talked to all of them, Benny, right? You know, my Aunt Lee, who Uncle Ralph, to the war. To the war. Everybody's to the war. Not the women. Although I will say my Aunt Frances served. So not all the women stayed home. I got about a split deal with my women relatives, both my aunt and my uncle, they served. <sighs> Full of a family that served. But when I talked with them about this time, they were so happy that when they were telling me about it, they were, um, they were smiling. They were talking about the fact, and they had these pictures, right? Black and whites. I mean, it was really interesting to see what they saved and collected. And one of them had like a sketch, a portrait. And at one point there was this sketch, a portrait with about three women in a small space with these rivets building big battleships. And when they talked about it, they talked about how, thank you, Winnie the Welder. When they talked about it, they talked about how freeing it was, how liberating, you know, how they got up every day and had a purpose, you know, how they all gathered, how they all got to be in community with each other. And it wasn't just about riveting. The women were called to do things during World War II that they never thought they'd be called to do. And not only did they step up to the challenge, but these folks are some of the most unsung heroes of our time. Just like the movie Hidden Figures. When you saw that movie about these African-American women and the becoming cornerstone for a NASA program that could have failed, that could have failed 
had it not have been for those women, I mean, think about it. That if that flight failed, there would be nothing for us to talk about. But today, what have we forgotten? A year without men. You know, it is a 12 point guide to inspire and empower women. But it doesn't mean that we're talking about a hate campaign for men. It's not. But it's to remind us of what we've done, how far we've come, and how much more we have to do. That's why joining me here today, and I'm excited about this. Benny, we're going to skip the break. All right. I, I'm so excited about this today because sometimes when I talk about women and I talk and I say things like a year without men, I get these emails and Allison's going to talk about the email thing. We're not saying that we see ourselves as a world without men. That's like the Amazonian women and Wonder Women. That's like where they come from that they did that. We're talking about what we have to remember about how powerful we really are. Allison, thank you for this. Thank you for the reminder. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, so how did I represent sort of a scenario that many of the young people can't relate to because many of them, like World War II is like, you know, World War II is like dial up internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we know it was a thing, but it's like so like not a thing but you remember that time that i'm referencing absolutely and, and i think that you did such a good introduction for the book because i've had the same reaction from people a year without men it it's not a uh, 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 hate hate against men it's not anti-men it's a remembering and i so love how you put that i mean if you look back at world war ii you know, women did, they filled in these gaps where, you know, men were at war and they had to go to work. But when the men came home, the women went back home. And so it was just a moment in time where we were able to see what women were capable of. But, you know, it took a very long time for women to get back into the workplace. And what's so interesting about the book is for me, this book, that's what it was. It was not just a remembering, it was me able to find out who I truly was. And I'm not sure I forgot. Sometimes you think about, well, did I forget or did I never have the opportunity? And for me, my that's life it. totally changed. I mean, if you would have spoken to me on June 29th, 2018, I would have told you, I have this beautiful life. I, you know, I had troubles in my life, but my business was great. I had two wonderful daughters and a loving husband. And I was really looking forward to all the possibilities and opportunities. And then on June 30th, 2018, my husband came home. I was at the, the kitchen counter. He came home from the gym. And what felt to, to me out of nowhere, he said, I'm leaving you. I'm leaving you to go date other women. We could still have family vacations together. We could still go out for dinner, but I'm out. I'm done. And for me, that was that structure that I lived within, the family structure. You know, we were partners, we were best friends. But within a two week period, my biggest male client for 25 years left me. I had no, everything just kept falling apart. And then I got invited to become the chief financial officer of an all day woman hospital where only women worked. And literally within a two week period, there were no men other than like my father and my brother. And I was surrounded only by women. And the experience, you know, I, I was in a lot of pain and, and a lot of grief. It was very difficult. But at the same time, not having men in my life, I started to remember and, or I started to learn the places that I hide, the places that I compromise, the pressures that I felt, you know, for 30 years in business, the places where I didn't feel I was welcomed. So this book is really more of an awakening, of a remembering, of a movement for women to kind of look for those places that were not fully empowered, that we could go in, out into the world and find true equity and true equality. You know, I, I want to talk about this in so many ways, but I want to go back to something I said to you before we started the show. And that is I work with women. I work with women and women in a lot of groups. I work with women in recovery. I've worked with young women, youth, you know, on spiritual year long journeys. I mean, you things like that. What I what happened this year, though, for me was I realized that there's a part of what I could do that I'm not doing. And I got the epiphany in a couple of different ways. Um, one was when I mentioned Gloria Steinem and nobody even understood who I was talking about. You know, 
one person thought I was talking about the owner of the Yankees, which that was not Steinem, it was Steinbrenner or somebody. Um, but what I realized is we're not passing the baton. You know, my Native American friends have, I've spent time with them and I've learned more about their indigenous cultures than I think we know about the history or history of women. Right. And I think that you and I, in writing this book, you, you stepped out in a bold move of courage. Help me reframe this. If it's not remembering, there is something that has to happen with us as women, Allison. And the reason I say it is two things happened in the past couple months. One, I was talking with people in my women's group and I said, you know, we, it's exciting. We may actually get an equal rights amendment on the floor of the Senate. Equal rights for women. And almost unanimously, the cry was, We're, what do you mean? We already have equal rights. Okay. And then I didn't know how to backwalk that or walk that back. And, and I realized I have to explain it. The second thing that, that happened was two or three weeks ago. And I've talked about it on air. And I wonder why we are not hearing more from the women in our government about the fact that an equal pay for women bill was shot down in the Senate because they were afraid of frivolous lawsuits. So do you understand where I'm going and how it points directly to your book? Absolutely. I, I think we're walking, women are walking around thinking we've made it, right? Yes. And, and what, what's really interesting, if you look at statistics, you know, I always say numbers don't lie. They don't tell the whole story. But if you look at the statistics in 1991, men and women were graduating college, you know, at the same rate. So we're talking about wait, 30 years fast forward. Look at look at where we are in the S&P 500. Only 5% of women are CEOs. Only 20% of women are on boards. Uh, I think men and women enter the, the workforce equally, but men are twice as likely to get promoted in the first five years. So I think women are kind of in their own cocoon. You know, they're going to work every day. But, but but the most interesting thing I think that happens is when women don't have success at this point, they think there's something wrong with them. I think that so I think there are two things going on. One, we don't realize that we're not as far as ahead as we think because we're not looking around us, like and we're not paying attention. Like you think about the equal pay, you'll look around, you know, who's the CEOs, who, you know, how many, even just a woman being president, you know, it's it's not happening for us. And at the same time, when I work with women individually, they're blaming themselves. If I was so great then I would have gotten that job. If I was so great, I would have gotten that promotion. And I don't think people realize that, you know, the game is rigged against us to begin with. And, and we need to kind of recognize it. We need to kind of shore up how we feel within ourselves. And we need to go out there and demand that equity and equality. So the world is not offering it to us. And at some point we accept less. And then we just think that things are different than they really are. It's, it's very complicated because when I talk about it, women start to worry, well, what do you mean I'm not equal? What do you mean that, but we have, we were not, but we have so much potential to get there. And, and I think that's really what the discussion is. It was pointed out to me, something in your book was pointed out to me, little funny story, not so funny after I reflected upon it. Yeah. Um, but there are a couple of things you point out in your book that are just pivotal. And I hope you are taking this book and you're teaching. I hope you're teaching worldwide. I really hope, you know, that Allison, that what you're doing is you're taking the tenets of this book and you're using it as a way to not just educate, but beyond inspire, say there's something we can do because it's daunting. Um, when you look at the scale and then you look and you drop down to women of color, that it's not just disturbing, it's, it's yeah. disgusting yeah. Um, beyond anything that you can imagine. And yet, I'm okay, you're okay. You know, don't ruffle any feathers. Yeah, and so let's talk about how it's playing out in our country for a moment. Now, yeah. if we were in Germany, uh, the chancellor of Germany, you don't get any more powerful than her. Right. I mean, she is bold. She is well spoke. She, you know, who's in charge of Germany? Raise your hand. Yes, yes. 
Ambassador Merkel. Thank you so much for that. But it's interesting as I'm watching this, young people like 13, 14, so believed in a woman named Kamala Harris. They really did. For whatever reason, she sparked fire. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a couple of them the other day, and they said, where did Kamala Harris go? Yeah. I said, what do you mean? She said, th th these two young girls said, where is she? You know, why isn't she taking on voter rights? You know, why isn't, I mean, these are 13, like 13 year olds that were like, my mom's helping me write a letter to the president. Mm -hmm. You know, like, where did Kamala Harris go? And I asked myself the question because it is a microcosm for something bigger. Tell me what you think the bigger idea is because it's all in your book. The bigger, I, I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at. The bigger idea of? The bigger idea of how we can become invisible even at the most visible positions yeah. in the world. Well, first of all, you know, media coverage is everything. It, oh, it, thank it, you. Yeah, if we just look at that, I mean, media coverage is male-centered, right? It, and it's how these perceptions are developed. I mean, the younger kids, they're watching, you know, the Instagram, the TikTok, um, all of that. The news coverage, we're always talking about what women are wearing. We're always talking about how they look. We're always looking for the moments. Even if you look at, you know, about the presidential election, you look at the coverage. Like, how much coverage did they have about Amy Klobuchar eating salad with um with a with a comb? You know what I'm saying? And then you know you have Donald Trump. You know, and it's not a political show, I know, but it was just interesting how the coverage is, and we're always kind of looking for women. You know, those parts we're judging women based on not the most interesting thing about women, and then we hold them to a higher standard. That's what's so interesting. Even if you look at Hillary and Donald Trump, it, I, I know these are complex issues, but the media perpetuates it. So there's not a place in our society, corporate America perpetuates the inequality and, and the lack of equity. The media does, the media keeps portraying women as less than. Um, even if you look at what happened just with Victoria's Secret, they decided to get rid of all those young angel women, but then they picked women in their thirties who are very wealthy, who are very educated, who've had a lot of work done on themselves, to that be the new woman? How is that the everyday woman? So it's almost like they just up the age by 10 years, right? And so we're never given those models out there that we could look towards. And if we are, those models are not treated equally and we're the quality in the media and everything else. So it's kind of like we have to you know, it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work to see the truth. And then it's a lot of work to empower ourselves. There's so much against us, but at the same time, I fully believe that there's an opening in this moment for women too. to rise up, to come forward, to start their own businesses, to, to demand that there's more equity in corporate America. We have this moment, but like, I think you're getting to, we have to be aware of it and we have to be courageous enough to come out and say, hey, this is not working. And I'm valuable enough to be in that same place as every man. And that's the thing. We let the outside world change how we feel about ourselves. And so we, it's, you know, it's an inside job, but the outside world is not helping. Well, and one of the things you talk about in the book, and I want to really roll right into it, it's really been, it's an interesting paradox. Um, I know you must, I, look, there's nothing that is more shocking than a breakup, a divorce, a uh, blindsided divorce. And what we do as women is we ask others, right? What do you think I should do? How do you think I should do it? And the reason I'm bringing this up, maybe you didn't do that, your divorce, but we have this sense of us that we will ask, we will ask, what do you think? You know, and sometimes it's seen as a point of weakness and vulnerability. I learned this as being the only woman manager at the telephone company and facilities management for 10 years. I learned not to ask somebody else's opinion of something. And yet at the same time, we are so quick to accept another person's point of view. Do you find that kind of women-sided? 
It, absolutely. I, well, I think also because we're we're always judged in a way. You know, it, the put downs are very subtle. You know, you look. I'm not as successful as my male counterparts. I think after a while, again, you say, well, there must be something wrong with me. And the minute you think it's you you're going to believe what other people say. And it's so interesting that that was one of my biggest realizations that this idea that just because someone says it doesn't mean it's true. And, and that's like the flip side of it, right? That not only are we asking people what we think, but we're believing what people tell us. And it's only because of we looking at our life. And again, we think if we were so wonderful, why wouldn't it be different? So then we go to the outside world and say, you tell me what's best for me. You tell me how to do this and then I'll know. So yeah, women are filled with a lot of doubt because of the past. And for me, that was one of the biggest realizations. If I didn't get that, and if I didn't turn to me, I was going to be believing that there's something wrong with me. My husband left me. I'm not worthy. I can't make it. I mean, I could tell a really great story at this point, right? I have all the makings for a story that my life will never be great again. I'll never have those the grandkid story with the big family. But I realized that that's the story. That's the expectation that I was sold. And that's yeah. the expectation I held on to. So unless we go back to ourselves and we start asking ourselves, you know, what's our truth, right? That's a hard thing to do. What works for us? The whole world is going to tell us. So I don't think there's anything wrong with asking people for advice, but we have to be strong enough within ourselves to know who we are. Right. And then to, to move forward, it, it's really tricky. But at the same time, that was one of the, my biggest moments just because someone says it doesn't mean it's true. I was, I'm interv I'm being interviewed more recently, especially now with the new, <clears throat> new technology and I'm gonna be out in the world talking about it a little bit. So I'm gonna ask some interesting questions, Alice, and I'm gonna ask you a couple of them. Okay. You know, I was asked a question uh, about, they, this is a person that knew about my working career starting in the mailroom, going from homeless to starting in the mailroom to corporate executive at AT&T, right? Um, to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. It was out of integrity for me. I had an epiphany moment. Mm -hmm. An alien took over my body and gave me enlightenment. Uh, I'm not kidding. That's true. I, I, it's true. Um, but I get asked interesting questions about that part of my life. Now that I've started to share it, one of the questions I got asked was, you know, Pat, in your corporate career, you've talked about a few things but is there anything that you feel that you made a contribution to change policy, procedure beyond your day-to-day -day job? And the point was, and this was a little sarcastic, snarky question mm -hmm. by him. It was a little like, seriously, you talk about the job, you know, you're just a number, 66147. Right. Can you believe I remember my ID number, 66147? I mean, is that funny? Um, and so he was basically saying, don't even bother talking about it. You really didn't make a difference. But let's talk about this. Because if we don't start to talk about and honor our, our, our contributions, Allison, we're not going to be able to help other women do that. Right. Can you talk to the points in time, even now, where you feel you're contributing, where you right. feel you're on the edge of helping others? It's so interesting. If I go back to the beginning of my career when I was a lawyer at a large firm, I felt it was hard. I, I felt it was very hard to contribute. And, and what happened is I went on my own as a lawyer, but I felt the, the places where I contributed the most, quite honestly, was in not-for-profit humanitarian work. And it's interesting. That's where I went because I needed to feel like I could make a difference. And that's where, you know, my life really changed a lot. And then, you know, I became a life coach and, and, but it was always outside of that corporate system because when I was in the system, I, I felt that I was just a number, but what's so interesting is that, you know, right after my husband left, when I got invited to come into this company called the motherhood center, and it's a day hospital for women with postpartum depression, it's an all woman company. There is no men there. There was a, she actually asked her partner to leave who was a man. So we're all women. And I really feel that I contribute. And the reason why I, it's so easy to contribute is because that barrier is not there anymore. There's no one rolling their eyes. There's no one judging me because I'm a woman. We're all the same. And because we're all the same, it's, there's more collaboration. And that, that limit, that place where I always felt the resistance is not there. And now it's an amazing place. We save women's lives. I mean, even during the pandemic, I mean, 
we, we decided to, you know, treat these women on Zoom. And it's just a different dynamic. And I'm not saying that corporate America doesn't make a difference. Of course it does. But my individual, con individual contribution feels a lot different that I'm not fighting that one piece. Yeah. And, and I think, and you know, you're going to be important for me because once we launch our technology, I'm going to create a summit. And I'm so clear about doing this. And it's not going to be the kind of summit that you hear about. You know, every time we get together, it's usually a summit where we're going to, we're going to get a bunch of people on, they're going to sell you stuff. That's not what I want to create. I realize, and I believe you and I, if I could speak for you for a minute, and even <laughs> Benny, Benny and Olivia, I don't want to leave men out of this because right. men to me have helped me more in my life and career than you can imagine. And I want to talk about that when we come back. But one of the things that I realized, and I'm seeing it again, is there cannot be nine out of 10 women in a group that didn't know they were just denied equal pay. Right. And the fact that I know that that's a thing and I'm not doing anything about it, shame on me. And so when we come back, I wanna talk about this. The other thing I wanna talk with you about is that learning how to look at what we envision for our life versus expectations is really the key to success. You know, you are a, by any poke of the imagination, a successful and powerful woman. You know, went to school, became a lawyer, author, speaker, right? You are by every aspect of the imagination, that woman and allow yourself to be vulnerable to write this book. There's nothing more powerful than vulnerability to help other people. When we come back, let's talk about the double-edged sword of the gifts that we have as women yeah. and how to use them. It's a great book, so, so good. Allison Carmen, everybody, we're going to take a short break. We have a couple of copies of the book to give away, A Year Without Men, a 12-point guide to inspire and empower women. And it really is that guide. And, you know, to think about this in the way, if you think about my aunts, if you think about my aunt with the hard hat on and having the joy in her face when she talked about this point of time and then what came for her, literally it killed my mother. It literally, the feeling of disempowerment that happened and how these women lived, it's just beyond anything that we can imagine in contemporary women. Let's take a short break when we come back. Hey, Benny, 1-800-930-2819, copies of this book, awesome book. When we come back, is vulnerability our greatest gift? Mm -hmm. We'll be right back with Allison Carmen. Allison, before we continue, one, how do we find out about you? How do we get copies of the book? Because this is a bigger conversation than we've got an hour to spend. But I do know this. It is, for me, haunting me about an action I know that I can take, and I'm not 100% clear about what that is. And I'm going to be asking our listeners about it. But how do they find out about you? How do they tap into this book? I read the book. That's why I'm asking you the questions I'm asking. Okay. But tell us about you for now. Okay. Um, you, I have a great website, allisoncarmen.com. The book is available at major bookstores and online retailers like Amazon, Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, I have a great podcast, 10 Minutes to Less Suffering, which you can get on Spotify or iTunes. And my email is allison at allisoncarmen.com. And I'm really interested to hear what people think about the book. I'm really interested to hear about women experiences. Like you said, this is the beginning of a really wonderful conversation about where women are and what is possible. And again, I, this book is a hope. It's a hope that by revealing my experience, by revealing my experience in business, in my personal life, um, what could possibly be? I, I think that so much is possible, but we have to first kind of figure out where we stand, what the business world really offers us and who we need to be to go out into the world and demand that equity and equality. Um, I want to take a page from your book and, 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 you know, follow up on that. And the page I want to take from your book is, in, is really referencing what we started to talk about before the break. 
and it's about this level of vulnerability. You reference one of my mentors and what I think is one of the most incredible pieces of work. Maybe it's a documentary. Somebody should do something, a, a, a movie about his life. And that is Dr. Viktor Frankl. Mm. And you reference him in the book. And the way you reference him in a book was so powerful when you're, he's he had to have an influence on you for you to have him in the book like this, right? No, absolutely. You know, I had read his book, Man's Search for Meaning, many, many years ago. And, um, but it didn't connect with me until my husband left, until I had that such deep level of suffering that, that scorched earth that I didn't think I was going to make it, that I really understood what he was talking about. You know, you know, he talks about, and, and the quote I don't have on me, but he talks about, you know, you know, life has suffering in it. And I think a lot of us, especially in the United States, like to deny that fact, but he talks how suffering is like gas and, and it, and yep. whether it, you know, it's a big tank or a small tank, it's just going to, it just fills up your tank and we shouldn't judge it. You know, it could be something small or something big, but we have to allow it, right? We have to allow it. And it's a part of life. But at the same time, what I learned from my experience that, you know, it takes bravery to suffer. It takes bravery to cry. And then it, after we allow ourselves to feel it, we get to know ourselves better. Mm -hmm. We get to feel who we are. And then at that point, we have a choice what to do with it. And, and, you know, look, he went, he lived through the Holocaust and, and that's just an unbelievable thing that he could look at suffering, right. With such courage, but, but he does. And so it gave me a lot of courage. And, and I actually wrote about him when I'm, believe it or not, in this horrible year, I actually had a breast cancer scare mm -hmm. and I was sitting in, in this doctor's office and that they, this woman, she kind of was this older woman. They kind of wheeled her next to me and she was lost her hair and, and she was all swollen. And then I remember thinking to myself, you know, I felt healthy. I didn't know whether or not I had breast cancer. I was about to get my results. And I looked at her and I said, what right do I have to suffer? Look at her suffering. Mm -hmm. And then he reminded me that we all have suffering. We yeah. can't judge our suffering. That's what we do, especially as women. We think, well, I shouldn't be feeling this. I shouldn't be feeling this hurt. I shouldn't feel that my, you know, my coworker hurt my feelings. No, it's okay to feel what you feel. You know, if someone's not nice to you, it's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to feel pain. That doesn't make us weak. We're taught that women are vulnerable, they're over-emotional and they're weak. That's not true. I say the most courageous person in the world allows themselves to feel what they feel. Vulnerability, tears, so what? It's what you do with that. What do I do with my tears? What do I do with my life experiences? And for me, I hope, that I went forward with courage and resilience. And again, a lot of pain, a lot of tears, but I decided to embrace the unknown, accept my situation, and it was very difficult and see what else was possible in my life. And I think that's what Victor Frankl leads us to, yeah. that vulnerability is a part of life and it's what we do with these moments in our lives that really makes us strong and courageous. I love that you included him because I wanna ask you this next question. I believe that, anyone, man or woman, that can experience a level of vulnerability the way we're talking about opens up a portal. And when you open up that portal, you're opening up a place for you to receive guidance information. In the book you wrote, and this is from Frankel. I love, I love that you've included this, Allison. I'm so happy. This is what you say. And he says, there was no need to be ashamed of tears. I want women to hear this, right? I want, I want everybody to hear this because we are so ashamed of tears. No crying in baseball, no crying at work, no crying in ping pong. I cry in ping pong. There was no need to be ashamed of tears for tears bore witness that a man or woman had the greatest of courage, right. courage to suffer. Mm. It doesn't say to suffer for the rest of your life. Right. And I think that's part of your story in the book is to move us from, you know, compare and despair mm -hmm. to beyond empowerment, right? Yeah. You know, we go from, you know, this compare and despair beyond empowerment to empowerment, you know, that place within that allows us to know that we can accomplish anything. Talk to us for a minute about the conundrum of vision and expectation, almost paradoxical. Yeah. Whenever yeah, I absolutely. talk about expectation, people say, okay, you don't have any expectations. I said, but you can have a vision. Right. Tell me about how you talk about it in the book. Yeah, and, and I just have to say about that thing about tears. When I went to the motherhood center, 
one of my first meetings, I, would meet, I was a meeting with a, a bunch of people. We're all on the board. We're all, you know, very senior, very experienced. One of the women started to cry. And I thought to myself at this moment, had I been at any other place, any other corporate business, it would have ended the meeting. She would have been reprimanded. Nobody budged. There are a group of women. One woman's crying. And as she's crying, she's talking. She got through the meeting. She said some brilliant things and nobody cared. Because at the end of the day, who, you know, it's, it's not how you're feeling at, at work. That's the problem. If you put your bad behavior on someone else, that's the problem. But if you tell your coworker you're stressed or you're worried, it shouldn't impact it. You know, and I think that it's so interesting that they say women are more emotional at work, but I find men more emotional because of anger, resentment. So I just think that's really interesting that, you know, when you talk about tears and vulnerability, that has nothing to do with our brilliance and our possibilities and what we're capable of. Um, but when you talk about vision and expectations, you're right. When, when you tell people, well, you shouldn't expect anything, it's almost like I find people get deflated. Like, what, what do you mean I, I shouldn't expect anything? Uh, that means I can't have what I want in my life. And we don't realize that expectations are when things, we thought things were going to be a certain way and they don't turn out that way. That has nothing to do with the vision because, you know, I believe that uncertainty is our best friend and life keeps changing and life keeps having maybe. So the expectation is when you, you get off the playing field because it's not the way you thought it was, right? But the vision is still there. You know, it, it's not, you know, the vision, the dream, it's all still possible. It's just, you might not get there the way you thought. And that's what happened in my life. When, when my husband left me, that was the biggest expectation I had in my life was family and the future and being together. And when that fell away, if I went with that story, my vision, there would be no vision for my life. And it took a while when you're devastated, you don't turn up the next day and say, Oh, I have a great vision. It took a while <laughs> for me to kind of like get back in there and say, well, what's still left for me to experience in this lifetime? What's the vision now? So the expectation is just the past story of how you thought it was going to be. But when you kind of collect yourself and you believe in possibilities and opportunities and you heal, there's always something new for us. And just because it doesn't happen today doesn't mean it's not going to happen tomorrow. And it doesn't mean it's not going to happen next week or next month. So for me, it's some of my visions are exactly the same and some of them are new, but I try not to let the story of how I thought my life would be get me. And that's what an expectation is. Okay. And this is really very important because imagination is everything. Right. I mean, any thought leader around will tell you imagination is everything. I mean, let, you know, we're talking about Viktor Frankl, we're talking about so many things, but we're mostly talking about this way for us to look at our lives and move forward. I want to ask you about this, uh, Alice, and one of the things I'm struck by is the statistics and the studies are now coming in mm -hmm. on, I keep calling it post-COVID, but that's, I don't want to say that, the impact of the past 18 to 20 months, let's just call it that. This, the numbers are coming in. And one of the numbers that is barely being talked about, clearly there are numbers about rise in alcoholism, the online alcoholism buying rate is uh, close to 600% mm -hmm. increase. There's a lot of things coming on about that. But we're now starting to get information about beyond burnout. We're talking about stress in a lot of different ways. And I want to talk with you about stressors and worries because you talk about them in the book. And is it that we just absorb more things? I mean, do we need to learn how to put up a protective shield more and yet not lose our humanity as women? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I do think that during the pandemic, women had more stresses on them, especially with childcare. I mean, I can't tell you, I mean, for me, I was working at a company where every single person was a woman. So there wasn't a moment where you weren't on Zoom that like three kids came flying in and then the fire alarm went off and someone had to kick lunch. And so we're all working and doing childcare. And it, and it was a very, very, for those of us who've had children or somebody was taking care of a sick parent, it, it fell more on women. And statistically it, it shows, and, and more women lost their jobs. So more women lost their jobs. And if they had a job, they had more pressure. So women had more stress during the entire pandemic. You know, it's interesting when you talk about putting up a shield, there's one thing that I've learned that when my husband left me, the pain was so great that it would have been very easy for me to shut my heart. Mm. 
Um, it would have been very easy for me to be angry, to say, I don't trust people, but that would have been changing who I am. And that's the problem when we talk about humanity and shields in our heart, that if we don't stay open, we're going to be less of who we are. And I believe the only way women are going to make a difference in this world is if they stay true to who they are, because that's going to be the essence of compassion and empathy and real change in the workplace. So how do we do that? That's a really good question. How do you keep your heart open and stay true to who you are? And at the same time, witness the things that happen in your life. And I think, and I talk about this a lot, I think the ability to tolerate uncertainty is really the key. And I, and I talk about how men and women, you know, they suffer from the fear of the unknown the same way, but affects women more because our road is more uncertain. So I think the principles in the book, I think that if you master your relationship with uncertainty, you will have less fear and worry in your life. Because a lot of times it's not what's happening in the moment. It's what you think this moment is going to mean for your future. So if we master acceptance and we are able to kind of be more responsive and less reactive and deal with these certain elements, I think we could be a heart, keep our hearts open and feel the world, but the world won't knock us down and we'll get up again and again and again. Not an easy practice, but I believe it's possible. And I think uncertainty is really the key. You know, um, I've talked a little bit on the show, Benny has heard me do it about the movie Black Widow. I was really looking forward to it coming out um there was an interesting turn of events and if you i grew up with comic books that was my escape so i know everything about comic books honestly i mean you know the marvel universe whatever you want to know but that's just you know i just love it i love stan lee was like a genius guy but black widow is one of the most interesting characters and what i love about talking about this it's not that it's a comic book or a superhero. It's what happened to the Scarlett Johansson character, Black Widow, somewhere between two Avenger movies, somewhere. And you start to watch her change. You start to see her change from, you know, this badass Black Widow spy that you know very little about to this incredibly vulnerable Avenger who gives the ultimate sacrifice. And the movie Black Widow has been sort of on the shelves for like a long time. And I was looking forward to it because I had a sense it would talk about what changed her. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to give out the storyline because I want people to see it if they want to see it. But boy, when you take a look at her journey and you see what changed her, you do get the sense of how powerful our vulnerability is. Mm -hmm. But you also get the sense that we, we also need to focus and harness that power. How do we do that, Allison? How do we as women help each other? Because we've never really been, according to a lot of statistics, really supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. But how can we help women now? of every age, harness that power. Well, you know, I, it's interesting. I try in the book to give exercises and things yeah, I saw. to help women harness it. Again, I believe your relationship with uncertainty is, is going to be the key because what happens is the minute we don't like what's happening, we change our plan. The minute we don't like what's happening, we say, I'm not capable. The minute we don't like what's happening, we kind of quit our jobs or, or we don't stay in the workforce because we can't think it'll ever be different. So I think mastering certain elements of, of things within ourselves really matters. But I also like what you said about how do we support each other? And you know, what's so interesting is that now being in an all women environment and I love, and I think it's wonderful. I think we're, we're not respected all the time. And I think we're also taught not to respect each other. And I, I think that sometimes we're, um, so we have to learn to kind of view each other. The, you know, of course it's because we don't view ourselves the right way. So as we view ourselves as valuable and equal and wonderful and capable, I think we're gonna start women, you know, viewing our women colleagues that way. And then we have to decide, you know, what do we want it to be like? You know, do we want collaborative empathetic environments and what are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to say to get there? And that, what you said in the beginning, that includes men too. It does it's not a movement with, you know, half the, you know, half the race, they're men, half the race are men. So like, we need to be inclusive. And the book is, I'm hoping men read the book. I'm hoping men read it. I mean, they might find that there are things I talk about in the book that will help them, 
you know, when you're talking about acceptance and uncertainty, but also understanding the female experience. And I also believe that if a man is working in a, in a, a, a company where they're not treating people the same, they're not treating people e equal, one day it'll be his turn. One day someone will get sick. One day he'll have an issue. He'll have a health issue. That company's not going to treat him well either. And so corporate America needs to change for everybody. You know, we need to look at equity. We need to look at the entirety of people's lives. So much has to happen. But I believe that we need to change from the inside. We need to support each other. Men need to come on board. And I think it'll make for a better world for everyone. Um, that's just how I see it. Look, I know this, this hour went really quick, didn't it? It's like, where did it go? Um, thank you for today. But also thank you for the body of work that you're doing now and what you're going to be doing with this. Um, would you just take a moment for all of us and remind everyone how they can find out more about you and how they could also get a copy of the book. Would you go ahead and do that, please, Allison? Sure. And also yeah. social media. People can also real stay in touch with you over social media and really keep, you know, keep in tune with what you're bringing out afresh, anew from the book, et cetera. It, absolutely. Again, the website is allisonallisoncarmen.com. Uh, my Twitter handle is gift of maybe my Instagram is Allison Carmen. You can buy the book at all major bookstores and online retailers like Amazon, Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And I also have a podcast 10 minutes to less suffering. And I hope to keep the discussion going um, because there's so much more to say. I mean, this was an experience of one year in my life and the realizations that I had when there were no men in my life, but there's so much more to talk about. Like you talked about politics, you know, how corporate America can change, you know, how women will be in the post pandemic era. So there's a lot to talk about. Things change every day. But again, this book is a hope. And I believe there's so much more possible for all of us, but we have to be aware of it. Right. And we have to be willing to be open and vulnerable and keep our hearts open and really work on the places that we hide so we could be fully embodied and value ourselves and go out into the world as women and really start using our voice to make a difference for ourselves, our families and the world. And I love one of the messages as well is it's not them against us, it's them and us. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the powerful messages, not only in this book, but it's been part of your work. It's been part of your passage. Um, Allison, one last question. What's your personal message? What would you like to leave us with here today? And again, thank you. Um, like I said, I, I feel very hopeful and uh, that I, I hope women will start looking at the places that they don't feel equal or they feel stressed or they feel worried and they'd stop blaming themselves and they'd stop making it about what they're what they can't do and what they're not capable of and it's their fault and really start looking at the systems around them and start looking within and seeing the places that they don't love themselves that they don't value themselves and I really hope that my book helps them I there like I said there are a lot of great exercises and, and there's a lot of great information like you said there's so many wonderful things happening around the world there are so many fabulous women and so many people who are just ready to give information for empowerment and love and I just really believe that women are warriors. I believe they're fabulous business people. And I think they're full of potential. And I think this is an amazing moment for women to really start going out there, speaking truth, making a difference and making the world a better place. And I'm going to remind you and I that we actually, as women that have been traveling this pathway, I don't know about you, but I really feel obligated to do more. I Absolutely. know I can do more. I know that there are things that I can do. Now, if you're going to ask me what that is, hopefully you and I can put our heads together. Yeah. And maybe we can create something. That, Allison, that would, thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. And I and thank you for your vulnerability and inspiration. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's take a short break. When we come back, more about vulnerability. We're going to be talking with the pushy broad from the Bronx because we're taking on recovery recharge. What is the spiritual side of recovery? And yes, that statistic I gave about alcohol consumption. Yeah, that's what's happening. We'll be right back. Thank you.